It is, it is really quite a treat to have Kara Black with us this evening. This year um, is, I think, uh, the 19th year, almost the 20th anniversary since Kara's now famous Paris-based uh, female private investigator, M.A. LeDuc, first appeared in print. Uh, LeDuc's adventures have taken her to some of the darker parts of the City of Light, often, uh, though, affording her opportunities to put her talents at disguise and computer hacking to work, and time and again, showing her to be a, a sharp, hip, no-nonsense, and thoroughly modern woman. Uh, Murder on the Left Bank uh, is the 18th in Kara's series of murder mysteries. Each has built on the history and character of a, a Parisian arrondissement um, in which it's, it's set, uh, and the fictional tales have tended to be derived from real life stories. Uh, Kara has said that she strives in her writing to display the real Paris, the gritty city behind the facade that uh, many tourists see. Uh, and to that end, her books have skillfully meshed the living vibrant aspects of the French capital with its history and the ghosts of its past. Since making her first trip to Paris during her high school years, Kara, who lives in San Francisco, has traveled there and continued to, continues to travel there uh, many, many times. Uh, on each visit, she has said she entrenches herself in a different part of the city, and to help gather story ideas, she's made a point of visiting with private detectives and precinct chiefs, uh, a number of whom have become friends, uh, to hear their, their tales. Now, I'm not going to get into the sus suspense, suspenseful plot of Kara's latest novel. I'll leave that for her to describe uh, in a moment. But I will say that once again, she succeeded in combining a riveting mystery with an engaging look at the culture and politics of Paris. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Kara Black. Bonsoir. Et bonsoir, Tammy. So nice to see you my DC friend. So voila, I'm here in Washington DC. It's wonderful and I'm so happy to be back at Politics and Prose in its new location. I thank Brad for welcoming here, me here. I hope you saw Anne Ma, a friend of mine who was here a few weeks ago. She did the uh, great story about Burgundy and the resistance. Um, the name's escaping me, but you should get that as well. It's a wonderful story. Um, so, <laughs> So I write the Amy LeDuc Investigations. Um, and just to give you a little background, because people always ask me, why don't they pay you know, in euros, Cara? You know? <laughs> and I gently remind them that we, this story is set in 1999. And the books are set in, 19, in the 1990s. You probably had a phone like this <laughs> at that time. This is from a 1999 Paris match. And uh, those flat screen TVs did exist, but guess how much they cost? $21,000, yes. <laughs> they were a lot, so they were out there. Um, the GPS in France was only used by the French military, and we were paying in francs. There was no Facebook, there was no Twitter, Jacques Chirac was doing all the things they later tried to indict him for. <laughs> and, a com and in Mountain View, California, not far from where I live, I heard a radio interview uh, with, with the mayor of Mountain View and a councilman because in 1999 they were trying to figure out planning. And, and um, so the mayor said to the councilman, well, you know, we've got to go and talk to Larry and Sergey. They want to expand their, their office. Larry and Sergey, who are they? Oh, they're, they do something called the Google, the Google, <laughs> Larry and Sergey. So the mayor and the councilman went to Larry and Sergey's office, which I'm sure wasn't as big as this. And there was, he said there was free food everywhere in 1999, and they had 40, four zero employees. And they had hired the former chef of the Grateful Dead <laughs> to serve food. So voila, this is the world we are in, OK? Um, and in Aimé Leduc's world, 
She, it's September, she's a single mother. She has Chloe, her daughter, uh, who's 10 months old, and she's running the Leduc Detective Agency. So she's trying to earn the baguette and butter it as well. And they're her partner, René Friand, who is a computer hacker extraordinaire and a very natty dresser, is especially cranky in this story. I mean, he's really cranky. And Aimé doesn't know if it's because it's so hot in September, if it's because she's not keeping up her end of the business, or if there's a medical issue. And you'll just have to read and find out. <laughs> um, so that's where we are. Um, and Aimé and René are working in the 13th arrondissement where this book is set in the Bibliothèque Mitterrand, which had just opened at that time. Now, the Bibliothèque Mitterrand was François Mitterrand's last sort of you know, uh, homage to himself. It was finished after he passed away. But it's built, maybe you've seen it, it's along the Seine. It's like an upside down glass table with the four, the four legs. It was built without consulting any librarians. So the sun damaged all the books. This modern conveyor belt they designed, you know, uh, was spitting out the books. Um, and Amy and, which is true, and Amy and Renee were called to do IT. So, but I'll just start at the beginning of the story, if that's okay. So Paris, early September, 1999, a Friday. Pale afternoon light filtered into Eric Besson's wood-paneled office on Mon as Monsieur Solomon untied the twine that bound together a bulging old notebook. We were prisoners together in a POW camp, Solomon said, wheezing as the lawyers took hurried notes. Stalag 3, C, east of Berlin. Pierre saved my life, another wheeze. You understand why I did what I did. Besson capped his pen. The effort of talking had cost Monsieur Solomon, who was in his 80s, and he reached for his oxygen mask. After several labored inhales, he grabbed Besson's arm with a crab claw grip. But Pierre's gone now, Solomon said. It's all written in there, my confession, the amounts, dates, years of entries. Besson reached across his desk to take the notebook from the old man's shaking hands. He opened the well-worn volume to see columns of names and numbers, an accountant's tiny, perfect handwriting. He turned page after page, his eyes catching on names and frank amounts as it gradually dawned on him what he must be looking at. Monsieur Solomon's roomy brown eyes bored into the lawyer. I'm dying, get this to the right person. Besson reached for his briefcase. Tomorrow, first thing, I promise. <clears throat> no, you must do it now. A real pain, the old geezer. He'd waited 50 years to do the right thing, and now he couldn't wait one more day? Alors, I'll keep your notebook in my safe. You don't have to worry. Now, Monsieur Solomon interrupted, this can't wait. I won't leave until you send a note to la procure de la République. The old coot had barged into Eric Besson's office without an appointment, as well as anyone could barge with an oxygen machine. My secretary is left already. I literally should be in court right now. Monsieur Solomon pointed a knobby, arthritic finger toward the adjoining room. Get that boy there, your helper. You trust him? He's family, but the old man stomped his shriveled leg. If you can't trust family, then who? Send him. Another bout of wheezing. Worried that the old man would be carried out of his office on a stretcher, or worse, in a box, Besson stepped into the adjoining office where Marcus was assembling a new chair. Marcus was Eric's sister's boy, a gangling, baby-faced 18-year-old with curly hair and the beginnings of a beard. Here's another job for you, Marcus, Besson said. I need you to run this to La Proc, but I've got plans with Karine, a date. Besson reached in his pocket for a wad of francs. Do this, okay? Marcus glanced at his cell phone. How long will it take? Back and forth in a taxi, 20 minutes, that's all. Besson shoved the old man's twine-bound notebook, its handwritten pages spilling out into a plastic monoprix shopping bag, knotted the plastic handles together, and zipped the sack into Marcus's backpack. Go right away. Why can't it be tomorrow? 
Besson lowered his voice to a whisper. Please, it's important, Marcus. Who is this old fart? A friend of my mother's long story. The door buzzer sounded. Besson's colleague had arrived to pick him up for court in Mudon. Marcus, just get this to La Proc. Tell her I sent you. Don't talk to anyone else. Don't meet anyone on the way, except a taxi driver at the stand on the corner. Comprends? Marcus, perspiring, loosened his collar as he shut his uncle's door and scanned Boulevard Arago. In the humid afternoon, a woman walked her schnauzer. A car radio blared news into the velvet air. No taxi at the stand. Et voila. Marcus would pocket the taxi fare and catch the bus. His uncle would never know. Marcus turned onto narrow Rue Pascal and hurried through the dim tunnel created by the street that passed above it a block later. The tunnel echoed with his footsteps and with the rumbling of the cars passing overhead. The old notebook heavy in his backpack. He headed up the stairs to Boulevard de Port Royal. Marcus was almost at the bus stop. He savored the thought of the money in his pocket. His cell phone vibrated, his uncle. He ignored it. Marcus scanned the sidewalk. Corrine was standing near the bus stop and waved. Another call from his uncle. He ignored this one too. You're late, a big pout on her red lips. He eyed her lace camisole top and hip-hugging jeans. My friend's letting us use her place, remember? Marcus pulled her close. We're going to a hotel. No attic room with bed bugs in the mattress today. Karine shook her head. On your allowance? He glanced at the time. I've got to take care of a quick job first. Karine's mascara eyes gleamed. Why wait? What was the rush for this old fart? Would an hour matter? You're right. Meet me at the hotel on Cinq Diamant. Let me stash this first. Karine's perfume filled the hotel room. Marcus laughed as he came up from under the duvet, damp with their sweat. His laugh was cut short as a huge male arm caught him in a chokehold from behind. He gasped for air, tried to grab at the arm around his neck, but his wrists were yanked back behind him, then flex cuffs so tight the plastic cut his flesh. He was dragged off the bed and dropped face down on the carpet. The contents of his backpack rained down on his naked back. Where is it, a voice said. Fear paralyzed him. He couldn't breathe. A kick to his ribs, then another. Where'd you put it? Tell me or I'll keep it up. I, I don't know. Of course you do. Where'd you hide it? All this over a stupid old notebook? But he couldn't fail his uncle. Maybe he could talk his way out of this, get this animal to untie him, and then, what, jump out the window? What about Karine? Let me up and I'll... He coughed into the beige rug, his mouth furred from inhaling the dust and pilling. The flex cuffs, slick with his own blood, bit into his wrists like wire. Karine was screaming, or was that him? He couldn't see anything but beige and then the blindfold. His body was jerked up and slapped across the desk, the impact nearly snapping his spinal cord. I'll ask again, where is it? What do you want? Marcus asked. Cut to the chase, kid. Then your fingernails will stay on. So. That's the beginning. <laughs> and uh, during the course of the story, um, I'll just briefly tell you a little bit, so otherwise I'd have to, you know, dispatch with you. <laughs> but um, um, what is in this notebook is something that's a 50-year-old secret, and possibly Amy LeDuc's father, who was a former policeman who was drummed out in disgrace and went to work at the Duke Detective. His name might be in there. And it's part of a cabal of dirty cops, fleeks, and politicians. So Amy is driven to investigate this. So um, I can't tell you anymore. You have to read the story. <laughs> but um, for me, a lot place in Paris really drives the story. And I, I like to think it's a character. Um, I was. I had flirted sort of with the 13th arrondissement for a long time. And then I finally became so enamored, I was going to set a story there. And one of the reasons happened because it's a big arrondissement. And it is part of 
small villages that were incorporated in 1860 when, remember, Baron Haussmann built the big boulevards with the trees and expanded and made Paris brighter and lighter. He also incorporated Belleville, Montmartre, um, and this 13th arrondissement as part of Paris. So that's the Paris we know today. And in the 13th arrondissement is the Gobelin Tapestry Factory. I don't know if any of you have ever been there, but you need to go. Uh, they have a museum, and there's a whole enclave from the 17th century, built in the 16, I don't know, um, by royal decree. And uh, it became a tapestry factory where they make, they weave, excuse me, weave tapestries like this. And these chairs, see the tapestry work? And of course, you kind of need a chateau, right, to, uh, <laughs> to, to display these. But even if you owned a chateau, probably you or I, we couldn't, we couldn't buy these. Because this, this Goblin Tapestry Factory only uh, weaves and makes uh, things for the state of France. So they're run by the Ministry of Culture. And uh, these tapestries and the furniture goes in the president's office, in the embassies. They're gifts for visiting dignitaries. And this tradition of this weaving process, the Goblin, has been going on there since 16-something. I mean, even during the revolution, they stopped for a few years. And I heard a story about how the people who tried to ransack it were down in the cobblestone cracks trying to find the bits of gold from the, the weaving. And, um, but then, it, even during World War II, it operated. So um, I went to see the museum, and then I went on a tour of the weaving, which is amazing. Some of these uh, looms, well, they are. They're as tall or taller than the top of this. You know, they go the length of this. And three or four weavers are working on one piece for several years. I mean, there's, you know. And the goblins have a special technique where they work from behind. They weave from behind, and they have a mirror in front. It's different from the other types. And I was fascinated with this. And then we went to the dyeing laboratory. I don't know what you call it, where they dyed the threads. And we went inside, and there were these old vats and these hanging colored threads. And the only thing that is modern about it is that it had electricity and a heater. I mean, we could have been in 1679 or whatever. And now they use synthetic dyes, but they used to use um, plants and insects to, to get colors. It's fascinating. It really is. So I knew I had to murder someone there. You know, it's just kind of, you know, kind of calling. <laughs> and. Um, so, um, and I was dying to talk to one of the tapestry weavers, but when we went on the tour, we were told, no, 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 they're very busy, we cannot talk to them. So as my want, I waited outside, you know, and when the weavers got off of work, um, a young, well, you know, I, there's, I always feel it never hurts to ask. People can say no, you know, no, or we. Oui. <laughs> so a young woman came out, and I introduced myself, and I said, this is who I am. Is there any chance you would talk to me? And she goes, yeah, if you'll buy me an apéro, sure. <laughs> so we went next door. I bought her an apéro and another one, and uh, she started talking. And she's young. She's, I mean, I'm guessing 27. She's um, my friend on Instagram now. <laughs> it's very cool. And she told me about the process. So in this enclave is also the school for tapestry of the Goblin technique. And she did it. It's a five-year uh, course of study. You learn design and colors and techniques and everything. And then after your fifth year, there's a very competitive exam all over France. And then you have to pass that. And if you pass it, then you can you know, move on. And she applied to do like an internship, no, not intern, like a probation to work in the Goblin. There was a space. She was on probation for a year. And then she was hired. So she has this you know, wonderful skill. And she's a, uh, uh, she works for the Ministry of Culture. And uh, she was great, really. And um, so I really wanted to bring this, you know, the, the way they 
they do this technique, it's like since the Middle Ages, you know, it's, and there's sort of a guild feeling. I mean, these are highly trained artisans. And I'm really hoping that Macron, you know, the president of France is able to balance his budget and still keep these wonderful traditions alive in France. You know, there's also woodworkers and guilders. And so, um, so I was entranced with that. I also uh, was looking at the bigger picture of the arrondissement. And there are some parts of it that used to be factories. It was very working class. There were sugar factories. And um, those had been taken down uh, in the 60s and built with these sort of Stalinist concrete housing blocks. Not so attractive. But they were cheap. A lot of immigrants lived there. In the 70s, a lot of immigrants from Cambodia came, fleeing from Pol Pot, Khmer Rouge, Laotians, Vietnamese. And they settled there. And people say, oh, that's the largest Chinatown in Paris. No, it's Le Petit Asie, because it's many people from different parts of Asia. And it is run, run by two brothers who are like a tong. And I had to carefully change their name in the book. But if you go to the 13th and you see certain uh, something frere supermarché, that's them. They run, they run this place. But anyway, that's another story. Um, so I, but I really wanted to write about the art that I was seeing on the streets. In the 80s and 90s, a lot of street art we used to call graffiti, tag art, became, became really, this became a place where there's so much street art, it was a big social comment. You know, Miss Teak and Jeff Arasol, who are famous, they're famous now, they're mainstream, but then they were underground and doing these incredible, you know, tags on buildings like this with, with reflecting the neighborhood. And the socialist mayor of the 13th arrondissement embraced this. So now on these not attractive housing blocks are these beautiful, they're like murals. They're huge and gorgeous, reflecting the people who live there. So it's really become this, this, this ancient art with this modern art in this one arrondissement, and it reflects the area. So I just really wanted to try and bring those together and explore that. And Aimé and René are, are doing pro bono work for one of the artist foundations. And poor René, not only is he, you know, has in love with Aimé Le Duc and she regards him as her best friend, but I know it's, it's terrible, um, but he's also getting a handmade shirt made for him at Charvet in Place Vendôme because he's a very natty dresser. And he's uh, getting his shirt, and then he has to go to this foundation to give an award. And there's a disaster with Limoncello on his shirt. And I'll just leave it right there. But it's, <laughs> it's very upsetting for Renee. Um, um, so also, what, oh, and I think I was telling Brad about this too. Um, since place sort of suggests a, a storyline to me, um, Aimé's godfather, Morbier, a retired commissaire who she who was the first colleague of her father in the police, who she put in a wheelchair. Um, I was wondering where he would live. And I was walking down this narrow cobbled lane, I tell you, with this two-story house that used to be a worker's cottage, but now they're very expensive. And I think it was like two maze ago. the wisteria was just gorgeous. It was just dripping over the wall of this house. And I looked inside the window, as I tend to do, because I'm curious. and. I saw that this cottage, it must have been opened up, you know, probably with small rooms, and there were skylights and all this light and this incredible um, mobile, a sculpture. I mean, it was like a calder or, or an arp, I'm sure. It was that kind of place that was coming down. And it was full of light. And then right where the wisteria ended, there was a woman sitting in a chair reading a book. It's a beautiful, beautiful image. And I was like, well, that's where Morbier is going to live because his wheelchair can go in. There's no stairs. It's around the corner from the police rehab hospital. Done. <laughs> you know? So it was really wonderful to try and bring those things out. Um, it's also very near the uh, municipal pool, um, Buto Kai, which has the, its mineral springs feed the pool. And of course, Aimé has to take Chloe to Bebe Swim. Things happen at Bebe Swim. And, with a red hoodie, and I cannot say any more. But um, I, it's really a, a wonderful area. And if you go, please 
go to the Butte Kai, which is, means hill of quails. There's no quails there now. But walk around, and you'll really see these pockets of charm with this sort of modern kind of vibe. Um, not exactly like this, but it, but you know you've kind of got this new new energy in there. Um, and what else did I want to say? Oh, I wanted to say that when I sent in my manuscript to my editor, uh, she said, ah, this story, it's about redemption. And I said, really? Because <laughs> sometimes I don't know what, you know, I have to finish a draft. And she said, really, think about it. Because, um, and I realized one of the characters who we've met already is probably, and I'm gonna use stereotypical terms, a good person who does a bad thing for a good reason and who pays the cost the rest of their life. And I think that was really, I realized that I was exploring a lot of that and how even if a war ends, and of course I'm specifically meaning World War II, the generations after, the people that were back home, the families that lived through this, the grandchildren, it, it doesn't go away. It's the unfortunate gift that keeps on giving, you know, which we can see, we will see today in our own, in our own time. But, um, and people have often said, you know, you bring things out about World War II or the Holocaust in your stories, and I, I think because of the time that I write, um, and I've said this before, I'm, I think Tammy's heard me say this many times, but there was a very famous speech that Jacques Chirac gave in 1995 where for the first time since the end of the World War, he acknowledged France's complicity with the Vichy government. Now, this in, in our country, it was no big deal. It was like this incredible bomb that went off in France. It was a fissure in the wall of silence, and people started opening a bit. And I think you can't, no book written during the 90s that didn't reflect this burgeoning, slow awareness wouldn't be, untru wouldn't be true to those times. So while, it, while this doesn't figure in every story, I think there's always some resonance there because my friends were living through that and talked about it. When I was there in the 90s, this was referred to. So I think it's being true to that time. At least that's my, my hope, you know. And also about, um, you know, France is a country that has a peculiar colonial legacy. You know, they were in, Indochine, North Africa, other parts of Africa, and those people, people who come, you know, have a expectation they went to French schools in their country. And um, so I think it's a peculiar, I don't know if Belgium has the same issue, it's a peculiar uh, legacy that they're, they're dealing with. And um, do I have time to say one more short story? So, um, I was walking around the arrondissement, and there's this wonderful, not far from the Gobelin, wonderful um, shop that repairs clocks and watches. Very old school, you know, like clocks you have in your chateaus, those kind. And I went in to talk to the man who was a talker. You always want to meet talkers. He wanted to tell me about, you know, his business and everything. And um, he had bought the business from Monsieur. And Monsieur had owned the business since before World War I. His family lived upstairs. And um, he showed me a picture of Monsieur dressed in, it's, I don't know the French term for the soldiers. You know, we had doughboys for World War I, whatever the French military outfit. He was dressed in his French military, going off to Gassin Lazard to go to the front Monsieur, with his family. Monsieur came back worked um, and had stories that he told the man who ran the shop. And he said, one story people don't know much about is that near the uh, Butokai, near where this hotel is, um, there were many Algerian men who came to work in the factories because the French men had gone to fight or, and, and so they needed workers. So that many Algerian men came and they couldn't bring their family. So during World War II, a lot of them were doing counterfeiting papers to try and bring family over. Well, when people of Jewish descent found out about this, they went to them as well and they and paid them, you know, paid them to make false papers. But there was this wonderful, um, you know, wonderful kind of, cooperation that went on that people never talked about. We always talk about the divisions, you know, but this was something. And I, I really loved that story. And 
Um, and Monsieur had so many stories about the arrondissement. Oh, and the fleeks. I have to talk quickly about the fleeks. So, um, as Brad said, I, I do meet police. And since I've been doing this 19 years, I've made some contacts. And some people are happy to talk to me. Some aren't. But um, I always try, you know. And I really wanted to meet a policeman who worked in the 13th arrondissement. And my friend, who's a policewoman, knew Dede. And I'm using his name, and I thank him in the book, but that's not his real name. So he said I couldn't use his real name. So, so Dede, um, we tried to meet. You know, he, he was very busy, and so I couldn't meet him until six months later. And he took his day off, which is a big deal for a working person, you know. He took a day off, and he said, I'm going to give Kara two hours. We'll have lunch. And then he had to go and take his kids to class, and he had to take his mother, a concierge, to the doctor. But it was very sweet that he, we sat down. Of course, I buy him beer or wine, whatever, and I keep pouring, and it's, you know. And I said, what is it like, you know? And he said, well, I don't live in the 13th arrondissement where I work. I live in the 11th near the Bastille because my family live here, my mother. And I said, well, why don't you live in the 13th? He said, I don't mm, where I eat. <laughs> I went, fair enough, you know. <laughs> but he really knew the arrondissement. He's now undercover, uh, but he started as a beat fleek, you know, with a uniform. And his first partner in the 13th was an older fleek. And so, of course, the older fleek is teaching him and talking about the, la the lay of the land. And so he knew a lot of stories about crime in the 13th, in the 90s. And then he told me, and he took out the map and he goes, OK, well, we've got the purse snatchings here. We've got the home invasion there. We have this one and this one, and you know, which I think, I think you need to know about crime if you're going to write about a crime story. Uh, so Dede was great, you know, and when he came, when he, he had his scarf on and he was, you know, he, we were outside in an outdoor terrace and, and he goes, well, I've got to go and take my moment to the doctor and he walks out and everyone's going, hey, Dede, you know, bye-bye, and he's like Mr. Charm, you know, really good. He told me about his informers, or as much as he could tell me, I mean, you know, but uh, feet on the ground, right, kind of thing. So. Um, or heels on the ground, as in Amy's case. But um, it was really wonderful that I, I get that chance to make these connections. And um, I've probably been babbling a lot, but um, I'm happy to take any comments or questions. Thank you. I don't know if I went on too long. I'm supposed to repeat the question. Yep. Would I live in Paris full time if I could? Do you remember um, the Diane Johnson who wrote Le Divorce? Do you remember reading that a long time ago? Um, I met Diane in Paris, and she also had a house in San Francisco. And I said, I met her at an event, and I go, "What do you? Are you going to live here full time?" And she goes, "No, I have the best of both worlds." And I went, "I kind of see that, um, especially when you see her apartment in Paris." I'm like, "God." Um, and she's this very tiny woman, <laughs> giant ceilings. And um, but now her all her children are married to French people, so they live there full time. But I really I love going to Paris. I go usually twice a year. Um, what I love is that when I'm gone six months and I go back, things are different. But I'm an outsider. I'm an observer, you know. And I think I hope that keeps me fresher, you know, to observe things. I mean, George Simenon, you know, the writer of Inspector Maigret, he was a Belgian, you know, he was, <laughs> it's, it's nice to have a, a step back so you can observe. Um, people have said, why don't you write about San Francisco? You live there. And I think, how would I, you know, I don't think I'd notice something. I mean, I could train myself, but, but I, I love going there and, and having it kind of fresh to have different eyes. Um, I mean, of course, if I was offered an apartment, I might change my mind. <coughs> if you're offering. <coughs> yeah. Have I ever seen anyone climb up a tall building in a mini skirt with heels? Um, there was a French film that inspired that from a French, what is, it was a, it was, no, it was actually um, Irma Vep, I-R-M-A-V-E-P. Irma Vep did, did it in a great cat suit. And I was like, well, I think Amy Leduc can do that as well. And when I started, when I was watching a lot of movies in the 90s, there was always a roof scene. 
Do you remember? I mean, in many French films, there was a roof scene. But it kind of makes sense, because it's the best way to get out through the skylight, get over and get into another block. And Aimé does that often in the Saint-Germain, and goes through a secret tunnel from the Senate to the Jardin de Luxembourg, which, which exists. But, you know, it's really convenient, you know, go up and slide down and, and be on another street in another alley. Brad's saying that there's, that we were talking about it, that there's 20 arrondissements and I've done 18 and am I saving those for the last or, um, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, in May, I was in Paris and I went down to Marseille, you know, French connection, and um, I met an, a certified gangster. I don't know how you, see, you know, but I mean, he was a, he was a gangster. Um, and I met a, a gangster, a, a fleek, who we don't know, you know, he's a fleek. Uh, we met, I met a postman who had been on the beat for 30 years to, and his beat, his, his delivery of postal mail was to uh, the Corsican um, godfathers down there. And he played poker with them. He was great. He was an incredible character. So I realized when I was talking with the, the gangster and the, and the fleek, that they were telling me, oh, this was in May, right? So Cannes Film Festival was, was happening right nearby in, in another week. And they were telling me they were collaborating on a script. And I was like, so they're taking their script to Cannes, and they think I have some pull at Cannes. <laughs> like I have pull at Cannes. No. But I don't know what they, so I think that's why they wanted to talk to me. But it was really interesting to hear this gangster talk, you know, and of course he was all changed, it was all reform, I mean, he, everything was, you know, it's all behind him, he's starting a foundation. Until we did a little research, and he's still active. <laughs> I had a great uh, French writer whose name escapes me, who was a contributor to Marseille Noir. I think, you know, there's all the noir anthologies. He took me around the panier, which means basket. It's the old part of Marseille that's all these little, you know, it, it used to be really funky, now it's getting hipster. But it's, it's the first scene in the French Connection, okay? When he takes the baguette, that's the panier. And um, it's a little cleaned up now. And um, he took me around, and he, he writes about Marseille, and was telling me about the Corsican Mafia during the early, you know, he had wonderful stories, because he grew up there. And I, I went, so what period are you writing about? And he just wrote Marseille Confidential. It's only in French. And I go, so that means there's other periods of time available? He goes, yes, go for it. So <laughs> I was like, I don't know. I think I have to go a lot more to Marseille. But there's, you know, Amy can visit Marseille, no? I mean, right? I mean, they can have a project down there. It's a, they have a lot of, they develop the, um, the, piece, the chip we have in our computers, I mean, in our cards, credit cards. Those were developed outside of Marseille originally. So, I mean, there's a lot of places to go. There's the, you know, world of uh, Chateau. There's the world of, I don't know, you know, so things may change. But, um, yeah, I don't know. And, it, of course, each arrondissement has four quartiers. So that means, in theory, <coughs> there could be 80 books. But, no, no, I'm not doing, <laughs> not doing that, no. But, Oh, thank you for saying Amy is a feminist icon. <laughs> um, how does this, how does, how does, I'm sorry, something about Me Too movement and how that reflects in the stories? Could, or precursor? Contemporary movement. Contem oh, yeah. Sure, I, I think it influenced, I think Aimé Leduc grew up in a, in a house of men. Uh, her American mother left when she was eight years old, is on a terrorist watch list. She had no female role model. Um, part of her wound is always missing her family, and now she has a baby. Um, and I think she knows that, especially the police, have a, you know, it's a boys club, it's a men's club, it's a, you know, um, and, they're, they're macho. I mean, French cops were and are macho. I mean, but um, it's also, I think, women in France, my experience, and this is me, I'm not a journalist, I'm, you know, I'm, um, my friends kind of get around that macho stuff because 
they, it's, a, it's a fact of life. I'm not saying it shouldn't be changed, but uh, they just sort of do what they want and um, kind of deal with the powers that be. I mean, when you, and Amy is always hitting that wall, hitting that, you know, because she's a woman, because she's not a policewoman, because she's being nosy, because she's, you know, trying to knock that door down. Um, I think it's just part of her DNA or ADN, as they say it in France. <laughs> I hope I answered your question. But not me. I have, a friend. I have a friend who has that gene. She can find something in a bin. Oh, sure, about Aimee's fashion sense and, and how she still looks good no matter if it's murder or not. And Right, using Nicole to smudge her eyes is for her notes and her palm. I used to palm, her palm pilot is this, <laughs> um, yes. yeah, and her fashion sense. And um, where did that come from? Not me. And I have a friend who has that gene. I mean, she's literally. We can be somewhere at the bottom of a bin. She'll find this this thing, and she goes, you know, it's you can work with that. And I said, what? She said, it's Givenchy, but we can, you know, gently work. I'm like, oh my god, you're right. Oh my god, you know, and. So I do not have that skill. I greatly admire it. Um, and she's very lucky that Martine, her best friend, they wear the same shoe size. So she can borrow those Louboutin, you know. And um, in, ooh, in this story, there is, OK, I think I'm going to have to start putting a disclaimer. It says, uh, haute couture harmed in the writing of this story. <laughs> because there is a Yves Saint Laurent, Le Smoking. Oh, it's, it's terrible. but. But it was only fictionally harmed in the writing of this story. But uh, I think French women have this kind of chic that is not just wearing you know, a, a brand, a, a label. And it was my husband, who notices nothing, who noticed this in a French woman. He said, you know, my friend Anne, it's not about all this brand stuff. It's that she's got a really good bag, a really good bag. And it's a forever bag. And she has a good a good coat, and she has a nice and and a good well, the good you know good boots for winter, and the other things. And it's about putting it together. It's about putting it together, mix and matching, and having that effortlessly tousled look. But it's it's how you put yourself together. You know the scarf from before and this and that and and I went I went to him and I said I can't believe you noticed that. I mean I could wear a bag and you wouldn't notice. <laughs> But I think men notice the fashion because one time in Paris at an event, an American man came up to me and he said, oh, my wife reads your books. I go, good. He goes, I read them too. <laughs> and he said, you know what I like about Aimé Le Duc? He said, I like the way that she, she never lets up and she never dresses down. <laughs> and I said, can I use that? And he said, it's yours. But I was sort of like a man, you know, I mean, men, of course men notice that. But, you know, I, I like that, what he said, that it's, it's about who she is. You know, she was brought up to look good. French women have facials every week, if many of them, not everyone. It's part of their life, you know, it's part of self-care and grooming, and it's like brushing your teeth, <laughs> as far as I understand it. <laughs> Good question. How do I ground, my, ground myself in the 90s at that time, now since we're about 20 years away and, and doing the research? Oh, yeah, I do lots of research. First of all, I mean, I was there in the 90s, too. So I took notes, and I have those old notebooks. And, and I remember what it was like as well. You know, I mean, sure, it was. There's things I forget. Um, I have to say, I did a reading the other day, and a man, right after the World Cup, and uh, one of the men in the audience said, you should set a book during World Cup, you know? And I go, done that. Murder in Pigalle, 1989, when the, was the World Cup fever. Aimé Le Duc is this much pregnant. She's reduced to kitten heels, and it was the World Cup going on, and she's trying to find Zazie. Anyway, I, so I had said it 20 years ago, but I remember what it was like for the World Cup. And I also like like the Paris match, I look at microfiche, you know, I can see Le Monde and microfiche, the newspaper, um, I can find it. And, and what I like about that is that I can see that day's events. 
okay? I can see what strikes were happening because there's always a strike in Paris, <laughs> right? I can see what the weather was. I can see who, what world event was happening, who was in Paris for some conference. Um, I can see what was on sale. You know, and I can see how much a computer was and whatever. And I, and I remember that, you know, and I, I mean, I also lived during that time. I have a neighbor who's French who works for Google now, but he was a programmer in the 90s in Paris. And he will ground me. He will say, uh, 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 Renee's using dial-up here. I went, that's right. Remember dial-up and pagers and all that. So I use different tools and techniques and to go back in that time. And I, I do. I, there's some, um, and, I, and I talk to people about what was it like in the 90s, you know, especially the cops, because they, some of them were, were in, the, like, like Dede's first colleague, you know. So there, were, there are specific things I can draw on, you know. It's just interesting, the further we get away, you know, how, how life has changed and not changed. You know, there were a lot of these, these tools that existed. I think Murder Below Montparnasse, Amy's riding on a bike or her scooter, and she has her she, you know, earbuds in, because they had them then, and Renee is telling her, well, go this way or go that way, and she's going, how can you see, how do you know which way I should go? He said, oh, I'm working on this program that my friend sent me from Silicon Valley. Uh, and is it beta testing when you test a program? Bet I'm beta testing this for my friend in Silicon Valley. And it's the precursor of Google Maps. Because they actually, before it became Google Maps, it was little, it was guys working in garages coming up with programs that Google bought. So I can, it's really cool to kind of draw on these things that existed in different small forms. Sort of. It was there. <laughs> Any other questions? Anyone going to Paris soon? I led a tour with Politics and Prose um, of the Amy LeDuc sites, murder locations. <laughs> well, they're <laughs> fictional. <laughs> and one of your staff got to go with us. Isn't that cool? A bookstore sends their staff? No crimes were committed. You can come with me in October, doing another one. Really? Yep, yep. It's, it's really fun, it's really fun. Especially for people who know Paris, because we definitely get off the beaten track, you know. Um, how many murders? How many murders so far? Yeah. 18 books. There's usually two or three. I mean, you know. Um, and um, I have to say, I have a, a friend uh, who's a, um, she's a forensic pathologist in near San Francisco. And I run a lot of the, the medical things by her. And I go, well, and she's always saying, you need to use poison, Cara. You've never used poison. I go, that's too Agatha Christie, you know, because <laughs> right nowadays you would find that. And she goes, no, I can tell you certain drugs that we don't test for in an <laughs> autopsy. And I was like, seriously? She goes, yeah, let's talk. <laughs> so get this, get this. I called her back, and she was, I said, what about that? And what, how would the blood spatter look and all that? And she's going, Kara, it's, well, it would be like, and she, I goes, where are you? She goes, I'm getting a pedicure right now. And all the, and my pedicure at most is looking at me very strangely. So she said, I can't talk about blood spatter right now. But, um, it's interesting how people really want to talk about their work and be helpful, especially the fleeks. They want me to get it right, I think. They really do. You know, you have a pride in your job. Yeah. I talk to anyone who will talk to me. How do I find out about police corruption? Or how do the fleeks feel about it? You know, people are very candid with me. And I'm also, and a lot of them are now retired. Um, so they tell me things, and again, this is fiction, um, but I think if I talked to a San Francisco cop, he would tell me the same thing. You know, I don't know, I haven't done that, but I think uh, they, I give them the books and when I finish. I don't know how good their English is, but they know, I tell them the story. I say, what would happen? I had a retired, um, well, he says he's retired, um, spy guy. 
um, I mean, a real, but he was the real deal, but of course he never said that. Um, and he was telling me it's worse than my books. And I went, okay, alrighty then. <laughs> Interesting. So, but I don't know. So are we. Thank you very much. <laughs>